How heavy of an object can like a EF5 tornado pick up? Is this something, a, a semi-trailer EF, truck? EF5 have been known to pick up uh, tractor trailer rigs, uh, locomotives. Oh my gosh. They can derail locomotives and tumble them around like, you know, like, like, a, dice. like a tumbleweed. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And it, a lot of these guys are, they're, are actually banking on the wind profile. Both vehicles, they've got skirts that, that either retract or touch the ground. Their idea is that the wind may not get up underneath it. But the problem is that the wind is only part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that um, tornadoes carry debris. I don't know if you've ever been hit by a 2x4 two, a two traveling 130 miles an hour. It, it's, there's not much that can stop it because you know, you've seen the pictures on documentary television. 2x4s can sail right through a refrigerator. They can sail right through a car door. Um, they might even do some significant so damage like, to a TIV or a Reed's vehicle. So I don't know. So it's like somebody throwing you know, spears at you at 200 miles an hour. That's right. Yeah, yeah it's a or, lot of velocity and a lot of energy behind that. And so they may have taken some, some uh, protective measures to protect against that. The problem, again, is if you're out here in a field, you've got a good chance to go ahead and set your vehicle out there. What's going to prevent that combine, that 20,000-pound combine, if it starts cartwheeling towards you and you're sitting there? I don't care what vehicle you have. You're toast. This is kind of dusty and dirty, but this is the uh, this is the new probe instrument, which is considerably larger. It looks heavy. Oh, it's 400 pounds. Jeez. <laughs> so what our goal was to and, and this thing's actually folded in half. We get it out, we put it on the tailgate, and there's another half that folds up. The objective is to get wind speeds up at a height of two meters. So we get this thing staged on this tailgate, and we practiced before we went out and did our thing. We actually went out and practiced. That's a good idea. Um, and we timed ourselves. The first time we, you know, got this thing unstrapped, dropped down, drug out, turned on, it was about a minute and a half. And I told him I want it down in 20 seconds. So we must have tried for several hours, and we finally had the technique down to where we can get this thing off the truck, turned on, and deployed in 20 seconds. And did you do it that quickly under real life conditions? Oh yeah. In fact, I think I think we did it faster. Yeah. yeah it's amazing. It's then. amazing what you know when something is chasing you. That tornado is probably from here to about the second or third pole down. And mm. did, did you ever take a direct hit, the yes. instrumentation? Yes, did it you'll up? see in the show, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we took some, uh, collected some first ever measurements of wind speed at different heights, which has never been done before. And that data is yet to be published. And did it survive? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> There's actually a smoke generator. See those orange things up there? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a smoke generator. So it tells you which way the smoke is going. Yeah, so I have this wild idea of trying to do a la wind tunnel laboratory experiment with the real thing. So I actually put a smoke generator on it and lit it up. And so the idea is as the tornado comes, we'll be able to understand how the flow goes into sure, the tornado show the watching path. the bright orange smoke. Did it work? I mean, did you? We were too close. Ah, okay. The problem is the smoke generators take about 30 seconds to go. Well, okay. the tornado was on us at 30 seconds. Get closer, Tommy. Get this and that's out. the thing is that you can't predict exactly how long these things are going to take to jump on top of you. It could be 20 seconds. It could be 10 minutes. It could just be gone by. Yeah. Then, you know, yeah. I mean, it's it's tough. The the good thing is, if you call it good, the more violent the tornado, the more of a straight line they'll go. Hmm, if they're really? weak and kind of, you know, kind of um, uh, short lived, they got a very unpredictable track. Those are the ones I actually worry about because. You know, they, I, I've seen them backspin around and curl around and do all kinds of things. But the strong, big, violent tornadoes, the type that take out uh, towns. You know, towns like Greensburg, Kansas, yeah, that, and Oklahoma City, more. Yeah. You, you look at their track, you can put a ruler on it. Really? Yeah. Um, when, when you're out there doing this, and um, you spend the season out there. How many tornadoes can you reasonably get? What's a, what's a good season for you? Well, last season, just yeah. to give you an idea, we saw a total of 70 tornadoes. 70, that's not bad. It's not how, bad. And how many days were you out there? Uh, we were out there for about 10 weeks. Yeah, I was going to say, it was just like a three-month run for you yeah. guys. So that's, yeah, almost we, a, that's almost a tornado a day. Almost. Yeah, almost. Now, a lot of, lot of those days, 
you know, we'll go a week without seeing a tornado. And then you get a bunch. But then there are days like um, like the Battle of South Dakota day. I think we've seen probably 10 to 12 tornadoes that day. Wow. One prolific supercell, if it has enough energy in the atmosphere, could just produce tornadoes all afternoon. And once you get the data, are you going to you publish this? What's yes. The, yeah. And yeah. In fact, there's a uh, there's a conference that's coming up in um, October, Severe Local Storms Conference, where the data will be first published. But that's just a conference. Then the next step is that we get it in peer-reviewed journals. We already the the TwistX group already has uh, two peer-reviewed uh, papers. Yeah. So. It seems like, uh, you know, I used to be a TV reporter, and my job description was, you know, hurry up and wait. It feels like that's the same kind of job, where you spend a lot of time, and then oh, yeah. when things get crazy, they get crazy. They can get real crazy. As you know, there's a lot of driving. Driving 30,000 miles in 10, week, in yeah, 10 weeks. And, and just chasing you, them after them. Just chasing. Yeah. No. Colorado to Indiana to North Dakota to Texas to Missouri. To, Do you try to centralize it, yourself? Uh, so no, you we're, and... we're weather-driven. Okay, so, so it's wherever the front is, wh wherever be. wherever we think the best chance of the tornadoes are going to be, that's where we're at. And do you use Doppler radar to find them, or what? What or do you? you we uh, uh, weather channel. How do you find them? Well, weather channel. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know. Channel. I wish I could say the weather channel. Um, actually, with the uh, cellular networks these days, yeah. we use the little uh, cellular uh, plug-ins for the uh, USB sticks. Uh -huh. We can stay connected almost ninety-five percent of the time, so we're connected on the internet. So you know, and we have we have uh, sources where we can get uh, uh, radar, visible satellite, surface observations, upper air, you know, things that we need to help forecast. And so basically, we forecast and adjust on the fly. This is kind of dusty and dirty, but this is the uh, this is the new probe instrument, which is considerably larger. It looks heavy. Oh, it's 400 pounds. Jeez. <laughs> so what our goal was to and, and this thing's actually folded in half. We get it out, we put it on the tailgate, and there's another half that folds up. The objective is to get wind speeds up at a height of two meters. So we get this thing staged on this tailgate, and we practiced before we went out and did our thing. We actually went out and practiced. That's a good idea. Um, and we timed ourselves. The first time we, you know, got this thing unstrapped, dropped down, drug out, turned on, it was about a minute and a half. And I told him I want it down in 20 seconds. So we must have tried for several hours, and we finally had the technique down to where we can get this thing off the truck, turned on, and deployed in 20 seconds. And did you do it that quickly under real life conditions? Oh yeah. In fact, I think I think we did it faster. Yeah. yeah it's amazing. It's then. amazing what you know when something is chasing you. That tornado is probably from here to about the second or third pole down. And mm. did, did you ever take a direct hit, the yes. instrumentation? Yes, did it you'll up? see in the show, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we took some, uh, collected some first ever mm. measurements of wind speed at different heights, which has never been done before. And that data is yet to be published. And did it survive? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> There's actually a smoke generator. See those orange things up there? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a smoke generator. So it tells you which way the smoke is going. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I have this wild idea of trying to do a la wind tunnel laboratory experiment with the real thing. So I actually put a smoke generator on it and lit it up. And so the idea is as the tornado comes, we'll be able to understand how the flow goes into sure, the tornado yeah, and show watching the, the bright orange smoke. Did it work? I mean, did you? We were too close. Ah, okay. The problem is the smoke generators take about 30 seconds to go. Well, okay. the tornado was on us at 30 seconds. Get closer, Tommy. Get this and that's out. the thing is that you can't predict exactly how long these things are going to take to jump on top of you. It could be 20 seconds. It could be 10 minutes. It could just be gone by. Yeah. The, you know, yeah. I mean, it's it's tough. The the good thing is, if you call it good, the more violent the tornado, the more of a straight line they'll go. Hmm, if they're really? weak and kind of, you know, kind of um, uh, short lived, they got a very unpredictable track. Those are the ones I actually worry about because. You know, they I, I've seen them backspin around and curl around and do all kinds of things. But the strong, big, violent tornadoes, the type that take out uh, 
towns. You know, towns like Greensburg, Kansas, yeah, that, and Oklahoma City, more. Yeah. You you look at their track, you can put a ruler on it. And make good good decisions when we come up on some real muddy roads. Because I don't care if you've got the best four-wheel drive vehicle and the best tires. There's some roads that you're just not going to go through. Absolutely. This thing is sprayed on about a quarter of an inch thick. Both the shell and the truck has it, has it on the top. And the reason for it is that we go into the nastiest hell cores you can you can ever imagine. Because not only do I research tornadoes, I research hail. Okay. I, I try to find the biggest hail I can find. And of course, you know, vehicles don't do too well in hailstorms. And so this is an attempt to try to save some of the sheet metal uh, as we make those core punches. Certainly the windows are vulnerable. Uh, the the overall idea is to actually make some hail guards to cover the windows so we can protect the glass. So tell me about what's on top of the truck. I see you've got like a wind uh, gauge. Yep. Yeah. What this what this is called is a, a mobile mezzanine. Basically, it's a weather station on wheels. It measures wind speed, wind direction, pressure, has a compass, temperature, relative humidity, and the idea is is for our vehicles to kind of get close to tornadoes and within what they call a supercell thunderstorm. A supercell is a basically a very powerful thunderstorm that persists for hours. And what we're trying to do is not only study the tornado itself, but also in study the also study the environment that that tornadoes exist in. And for us to do that, we make measurements nearby. So we built this rack system to hold all of this gear. The the anemometer or the, the the device that measures the wind has to be at a certain height so that the airflow over the vehicle is not affected at all. And what's yeah. a, what you got on the front here? What's this instrument right here? All of this gear here is to study hail. This is basically a piece of uh, carbon composite uh, material on the um, that's actually designed for uh, the Boeing 787 um, Dreamliner, Dreamliner aircraft. Their concern is is how well or how poor their carbon composite material that they designed and developed for their aircraft is going to lie, survive if their new aircraft sitting on the tarmac in Dallas, Texas, and they got a big old hailstorm. Does the is the aircraft there worthy or not? So what we're trying to do is help understand hail impacts of uh, two inches and larger, which has never been done before, really. I mean, for us to really study that, you know, you can make ice cubes out of a refrigerator and shoot them at a gun. But to really understand some of the dynamics and some of the variability of hailstones, you have to get out in the field and measure it. So how big was the hail you found? Uh, this year, we managed to get into some two and a half inch hail. Unfortunately, last... Baseball uh, size. Yeah, it's about baseball size. Yeah. Um, in South Dakota, I think back in July, a world record hailstone fell this big. Basketball size. Bas almost basketball size. And I wasn't there. I'm bummed about it. I wasn't there. That might put even a dent in the uh, carbon fiber of a Boeing plane. It would have smashed it. Yeah. It would have smashed it. Yeah. These blocks are what they call, there's piezoelectric sensors on here, and they basically measure the impact when these hailstones hit these blocks, just kind of understand the impact force. Um, what we do is we photograph the falling hailstones through a, with a high-speed camera sitting up on the dash looking out here. Uh -huh. That high-speed camera runs at about 1,000 frames per second. In order to run a thousand frames per second, you need lots of light. And that's the reason that there's two pillars, four lights each on each side, so that we can just kind of light this whole plate up like it was the like bright sunshine day. Uh, because it's very dark under thunderstorm bases. We can't obviously depend upon the sunlight. So um, let, me, let me tell you, what, let me ask you this. Obviously, this is a very safe and heavy and instrument laden truck, but it's not tornado proof. No. T tell me about when you were the most scared uh, out there. The vehicle is not tornado proof. In fact, it has probably the worst profile that you can have for chasing tornadoes because of the high shell. Yeah. Uh, so you know, I'm, hoping, can... I'm hoping to come up with another design uh, for next year to fix that problem because uh, we were in 80 to 100 mile an hour winds and uh, you get a sideways push and the truck rocks. Even as heavy as this vehicle is, it rocks. Um, and last year we were chasing a, uh, an EF4 tornado near Baudel, South Dakota on May 22nd. We were probably about 30 seconds away from that tornado deploying instruments. And uh, this, this vehicle was rocking pretty good. In fact, um, both rear doors, we had four people in the, in the vehicle. We had a Discovery camera guy that sat in the, in the driver, rear, rear driver. And then we had another um, uh, 
uh, meteorologist sitting in the back seat. When they both had their doors open, the wind came by, an 80 mile an hour gust of wind came by and just cleaned out whatever coats, uh, snacks, everything that was on the seat, it all went out the door and it never touched the ground. It just took off across the field. Like a giant vacuum cleaner. Yeah, like a giant vacuum cleaner. So, oh, so tell me, are you scared when that, in that moment of time? Or are you out there thinking to yourself, this is, uh, you know, my call to God or? No, actually, um, when I'm in those situations, I'm pretty focused on, you know, the logistics, job. the job and keep my crew safe. So I take responsibility for the for the, my, my, my crew safety so I call the shots whether or not we go or we stay or we drive down that muddy road or not so to answer your question I don't have much time to be scared so obviously the other guys who do this they like to try to get into the tornado I mean they're 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 yeah, right. their, their gig is to drive and have a tornado come right over them what, what's That's your right. feeling on that I mean it seems like you're more focused on doing the actual science well I'm I'm very focused to do on the science I my personal opinion is that I really don't see any real reason to be driving into tornadoes. Sean Casey, great friend, he's an IMAX filmmaker, you know, he's probably got the best case because he wants to get that, the ultimate IMAX shot of that tornado coming right at him, and right over the top. You can argue whether or not that's worth your life, you know, and he's actually pretty good. He can judge whether or not that tornado is too strong. He might, his vehicle's designed maybe to survive maybe an EF1, EF2, Push an EF3 or larger, I don't know. How He's got some problems.